Hi, everybody. Welcome. Uh, and thank you for coming in the middle of a glorious afternoon. Last Sunday, we were in the middle of the deluge. Uh, and today, it's, it's more than making up for it. So we have three sort of interlinked sessions uh, this evening and tomorrow um, to do largely with refugees and asylum seekers, migrants, people seeking to escape desperate circumstances. The first is this wonderful session on Lights in the Distance, Daniel Trilling's beautiful book. The second will be uh, some of the crew of the Ellie Samuel Beckett, our naval vessel that went out to rescue people in the Mediterranean for five years until the ports were closed, alas, in Italy. Uh, and they'd be here at seven o'clock. And the third uh, will be Reem Carsey and Caroline Williams talking about the conflict in Syria, uh, moderated by Sarah Hickson, who's going to moderate this event today. So the Syrian conflict is now more than eight years old with no sign of an ending and has caused the deaths of hundreds of thousands of people and the displacement of over half the population. Uh, many of those displaced have attempted to come to Europe with varying degrees of success, as indeed have many people from all over the Middle East and Africa, North and West Africa in particular. Daniel Trilling, who's our guest here today, has written a really wonderful book, Lights in the Distance, Exile and Refuge at the Borders of Europe, which tells the stories of some of these people and outlines their backgrounds, their suffering, their hopes and their dreams. And he has put a huge amount of work into interviewing these individuals so that we really, really get to know them. And he is going to be very appropriately in conversation with Sarah Hickson, who's a very old friend of the Galway Arts Festival. Uh, Sarah is a wonderful photographer who's worked all over North and West Africa and India. She's interested in displaced people, in performance and movement. She has a background in the theatre. Uh, she brought her extraordinary photographs of the Calais jungle here to the festival last year, revealing a vibrant community in the midst of atrocious living conditions and a fascinating record of a unique musical collaboration between some of those living there. And in many ways, Sarah's photographs of the Calais jungle complement Daniel's wonderful accounts of some of the people who were living there. You see the photographs, and when you read the book, you get... They really should be together at some point uh, in, in close proximity to the exhibition and the book. You get the interior stories of those who, um, who lived there. So please welcome uh, Sarah Hickson and Daniel Trilly. <laughs> Thank you, Katrina. Um, I'm delighted to be here this afternoon to introduce Daniel Trilling. Daniel is a British journalist, writer, and editor. He's written for The Guardian, The London Review of Books, The New York Times, and The New Statesman, amongst others, winning a Migration Media Award in 2017. Since September 2013, Daniel has been the editor of New Humanist magazine. He's reported extensively on refugees in Europe and has also written about nationalism. His first book, Bloody Nasty People, The Rise of Britain's Far Right, was published in 2012 and was long listed for the 2013 Orwell Prize. His second book, published last year, is called Lights in the Distance, Exile and Refuge at the Borders of Europe, and is the focus of our talk today. In this book, Daniel skillfully weaves together the personal stories of 10 people from different countries that he met whilst reporting on the refugee crisis as they describe their dangerous journeys across Europe and what happened to them next, we gain an insight into their emotional and psychological state of mind, the complex realities of navigating the asylum process as a refugee, and the inadequate and inconsistent systems in place across Europe. Together, these testimonies create an intimate portrait of the refugee crisis seen from the perspective of those experiencing it. The Observer said of Lights in the Distance, Trilling brings his reader as close as possible to the actual circumstances of those who have found their way to Calais or to Catania in Sicily or to London or to Athens, only to find themselves condemned to occupy space rather than live. And the New Statesman describes Trilling, Trilling's book as both a shocking and gentle read, shocking in that it calmly portrays the reality of people for, of life for people trying to enter a Europe that largely doesn't want them, gentle because through the careful telling of these people's stories, they become just that, people, not a mass. So Daniel's going to start by reading a couple of excerpts from the book to set the context for our discussion. Then we'll explore some of the questions around displacement, borders, and belonging that the book raises, 
And we'd love to hear your thoughts too, so there'll be time for questions from the audience at the end. Okay, Thank thanks you. very much for that introduction, and thanks everybody um, for coming along today um, and giving me the opportunity to talk to you about my work a bit more. Um, I'm going to read two short excerpts from the book, first of all. Uh, the, the book is based on work that took me around five years to complete. Um, initially, it was a project, in my mind at least, to, to go to the physical edges of the European Union and to do a kind of mapping out of how the borders there were working, because I'd read a lot about um, situations that were arising in different parts of Europe where people were trying to cross and were getting into difficulty, or people were being smuggled across borders, or police were cracking down on various forms of migration. And um, that project developed further when I started to actually meet and get to know some of the people making those journeys. And I got very um, intrigued by them and their lives and decided that what I really wanted to do was follow um, as many people as I could long term and you know, see where they went, learn more about them, what was happening to them, why they were making those journeys, what they thought about it, and so on. Um, but the first bit of the book I'll read comes right from the end, and it's from Ukraine, which is a place not so strongly associated with what's been happening the last uh, five or so years. Uh, but one of the reasons that I was interested in this project in the first place is because some of my own family were refugees, and my grandmother in particular who grew up in my house or down the street from me, um, was uh, born in Kiev and had to leave Ukraine as a child uh, during the Russian Civil War, and then was a refugee a second time in 1939 because her family had settled in Berlin and they were forced to leave in, uh, just before the outbreak of the Second World War. So I made a trip to Ukraine in 2014, initially to go and see where my grandmother had been born, but I was also very interested in, well, who was making similar journeys along similar territory at that point? And I heard a story about how Ukraine was part of a people smuggling route that was taking refugees from Somalia uh, through Russia, through Ukraine, and into the European Union. And so I went to see what I could find out about that. And this is just a, a scene from the end of that journey, which I think tells us something wider about how Europe's border system operates and what it's trying to do. At a town close to the Hungarian and Slovak borders, I arrived at a Ukrainian police base. I was greeted at the entrance by three uniformed border officers and a staff photographer. It's not often we get an international journalist here, the photographer explained, and proceeded to take pictures of me as his colleague showed me around the base. In recent years, these border guards have been asked to take on an increasing amount of work policing Ukraine's western frontier on behalf of the European Union. A treaty signed in 2007, part of a wider set of agreements on trade and movement, obliges Ukraine to readmit any third country nationals or stateless person who has crossed into the EU from Ukrainian territory. Migrants sent back to Ukraine are tried by a court for attempting to cross a border illegally and, if convicted, are given a prison sentence of up to a year before being deported. Unless, of course, they can't be deported. In theory, those migrants who say they want to claim asylum should be exempt from this treatment. In practice, as at other borders of the EU, this is often ignored. A lawyer in the town, whose organisation provides legal and medical assistance to migrants, told me that they had collected numerous accounts of people being stopped by guards on the Sl Slovakian side of the border, saying they wanted to claim asylum, but then being driven back across and handed over to Ukrainian guards. Those migrants who couldn't be deported after completing their prison sentence were faced with an unpalatable choice. Claim asylum in Ukraine, where the system gave them very little means of support, or try once again to cross the border. There were cases, said the lawyer, of people who had gone through a three or four year cycle of border crossing, capture, imprisonment and release. She introduced me to a Somali man who had experienced this. Before he was sent off to detention, he said he had been chained to a radiator and beaten at the Ukrainian border station. We don't come to Somalia, so don't come to Ukraine, he had been told. A Human Rights Watch report published in 2010 found that over half of the migrants they interviewed said they'd been mistreated in Ukraine or asked to pay bribes, with a few making allegations of torture. <laughs> 
the Ukrainian officer showing me around the base, at the town that I was visiting, a lieutenant colonel, said it wasn't true that Slovak officials had been pushing migrants back to Ukraine. They were just sending back those who didn't want to stay and ask for asylum in Slovakia, but who wanted to head further west instead. That wasn't the Slovaks' responsibility. Ukraine's border guards had to be polite and smiling and comfortable at all times, even when they were checking for security threats, he said. The lieutenant colonel offered to show me the detention block. We walked across a courtyard to a single-storey building with bars on the windows. In the entrance hall was a plaque bearing the EU flag and a logo for the Catholic relief agency Caritas, which said the block had been renovated with their financial support. One obstacle to the 2007 treaty was that Ukraine's border detention facilities hadn't met the EU's minimum human rights standards, so the EU had given them money to improve them. The regular prison system was regarded as too abusive to hold migrants, so two special immigration prisons had been built elsewhere in the country, partly funded by the EU. Two short corridors led away from the entrance hall of the detention block in opposite directions. One was the block for women, the other for men. The centre could hold up to 24 people, although at the moment only three were detained here. Two were from Guinea and one was from Somalia. I asked if I could meet any of them, but the lieutenant colonel apologised and said they were unavailable. Two more apprehended migrants would be arriving from the border station later, but sadly it would be too late for me to visit. My host showed me into one of the men's cells, a small room furnished with three camp beds. It was warm and clammy, with the breath of people who must have only been removed from there a few minutes earlier. This was Europe's border system, working as intended. Inconvenient people kept out of sight and out of mind, with their inconvenient stories unheard. Our last stop on the tour was the exercise yard. Here, in a concrete-lined courtyard a few metres wide, topped by a steel mesh roof, the inmates had tried to leave traces of themselves. There were slogans scratched into the walls in Arabic, Cyrillic and Georgian scripts, and in large Roman letters along one end of the courtyard, USA, Afghan. In 1887, geographers from the Austro-Hungarian Empire decided that this region was the dead centre of the continent. They set up a monument to mark the exact spot, a few hours' drive from the border guard base. We were some near, somewhere near the heart of Europe, but a border ran through it. So I read that because I think that points to a couple of things that might come up in the discussion later, which is that, first of all, I think there's something that's been going on a lot longer than just what we've seen in the news in the last few years, and that it reaches much further than maybe the locations that are familiar to us from the coverage of the refugee crisis, and that this is a system that, you know, if you're an Irish citizen or a British citizen, it's being done for your benefit. Um, but, as we've already heard, this book is primarily about the individuals that I met while reporting, and I just wanted to read you a short excerpt from a story about a young man from Sudan called Jamal, who I met in Calais in 2014. Um, I met him a few times there. He then disappeared. He was trying to get to the UK. I didn't know what had happened to him, where he'd gone. And he, uh, you know, we'd swapped contacts on social media. And months later, he suddenly resurfaced and he was in a completely different part of Europe. I didn't understand why. So I went there to meet him and find out what had happened. And he very kindly agreed to sit down with me and tell me all about his journey right from beginning to end. In fact, m more than that, he started with, from the moment he was born in Sudan and took me right up to the present moment. And the interview took three days. And this was right at the end of the third day. Jamal had almost reached the end of his story as we sat beside the river in the town he now called home. It was nearly evening and he invited me back to his apartment one more time to make dinner. In the kitchen we made a potato stew with onions, paprika and rice. We used to eat this in Calais, he said. If we found meat, then we'd put meat in it too. Rihanna songs played from his phone as we chopped the vegetables. A lot of his Sudanese friends had got into R&B and hip-hop since they'd arrived in Europe, Jamal said. He laughed as he told me a story about a friend who was now in the UK. When he texts me, he's always like, yo, 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 why can't you just say hello or hi? I asked Jamal again about the sequence of events that had brought him from Calais to this northern European country. He didn't want to go into detail. He didn't 
yet feel secure enough in his new home. But I suggested he could tell me just enough so that my readers would understand the dysfunction in Europe's asylum system, to give them a sense of the gulf between the way states try to regulate movement and the messy reality of life. He agreed to try. After a friend of mine crossed over to England, Jamal said, I started to become calm in my mind, and I said, let me try something while I'm taking a break from trying to hide underneath lorries. At a squat in Calais, he had made friends with a man from Eritrea. We would meet at the squat. Every time I went there to charge my phone, I would speak to him. Jamal didn't want the other Sudanese refugees to know he was meeting up with an Eritrean, because if I get caught talking to him, people will say I'm causing problems. Jamal had a rule that he was very proud of. Don't tell anybody what you're going to do until you do it. And it was in play again. As he had done when he was living in Greece, Jamal used his new friendship to educate himself, learning the names of other places in Europe where a young man like him might get a better deal. After being ostracised by many of the other Sudanese refugees in Calais, because he was from a diff different ethnic group to the, the majority, he wasn't as keen as he used to be to join the Sudanese diaspora in the UK. Perhaps he would fare better elsewhere. Based on what his new friend had told him, he chose another country. Jamal left Calais and went back to Paris. He was taken aback to see how many more people there were sleeping rough under the railway track where he'd been a year previously. Before, there were only 30 of us. Now it was around 100. He spent three days in Paris, mainly in internet cafes, researching his new destination. On the third day, Jamal phoned a contact who said he could arrange transport for a few hundred euros. Jamal made a playlist for the journey on his phone. Sean Paul, Jennifer Lopez, Rihanna, and a lot of English rappers since I was going away from England. At La Chape uh, in Paris, the Sudanese contact met him and took him to a train station. There, he was shown to a waiting car. One man sat in a driver's seat. Two men who spoke Syrian Arabic sat in the back. The driver wasn't Sudanese, Jamal said. He wasn't French either, but I don't know where he was from because he didn't speak to me at all during the journey. When the driver stopped for a break, he would write out a note in English on the dashboard telling the passengers how long they could get out of the car for. After some time, the car stopped and the two Syrian men got out. Then Jamal and his driver continued, still without speaking. Jamal had his playlist. I kept listening to Loki's Dear England. Do you know that song? I didn't, so I asked him to play it to me. He paused Rihanna midway through American Oxygen and switched to Dear England. It was a melancholy track with lyrics about police brutality, about military intervention overseas, and treasures looted from the empire and displayed in the British Museum. When Jamal reached his destination, he wandered around until he found some police officers who could tell him where the nearest asylum reception centre was. I got there, they took all my details, my date of birth, my nationality. I stayed there three or four days, then they sent me to a camp. At the camp, he applied for asylum. He was interviewed. The interviewers asked him questions about his home country, his reasons for leaving, why he hadn't stayed put elsewhere. He answered their questions, hoping that they would satisfy criteria his interviewers did not let him see. They called him in for a second interview and asked him all the same questions again. He answered them again. Then Jamal received a letter saying his application had been accepted. The last time I had a passport was when I was in Sudan, and that was a false passport so I could get out, Jamal said. That was the first passport I ever got. Now I'll have a real one. My passport here will be my first real one. I will not be afraid of everything in my head. I hardly knew Jamal, and yet he'd told me his story in such detail. His whole adult life up to this point, he'd left Sudan just as he turned 18, had been shaped by systems for protection, for deciding who deserves which resources and where, that weren't working as they should. Instead, he'd had to build small networks of friends or acquaintances with whom he shared temporary goals and use those to survive. So why did he trust me, and why did I trust him back? While we were waiting for the stew to finish cooking, Jamal described how, in the evenings, at the Sudanese camp behind the supermarket in Calais, men would sit around the fire and try to burn off their fingerprints. They were mutilating themselves to avoid detection by the European police database, 
so that they could make an asylum claim in France while trying to reach the UK at the same time. You put one end of a metal pole in the fire, Jamal said, and wait for it to go red hot. Then you take it out and run your fingertips along the glowing end, one by one, for an hour or two, until they're too blistered to be recognised by a scanning machine. Like this, he said, grabbing my hand and pressing it into the handle of the fridge door. He pushed my index finger into the metal and ran it downwards firmly two or three times. Thank you, Daniel. <laughs> so there were many different things that we'll, we'll cover, I'm sure, in the next half an hour or so. But I want to start by, by asking you, as, as a journalist, you'd been researching and writing about the refugee crisis for a good while. Why was it important for you to tell these stories in this way in the book? And, and how did you decide where to focus your attention and whose stories to tell? Yeah, so like I said, initially my idea for the project was more one of mapping out what was going on geographically. Um, so this is, you know, I decided that I seriously wanted to seriously work on this subject at some point in 2013, which was before what we have come to know as the refugee crisis had really uh, gathered momentum. And at that point, it seemed that people, I felt like the kind of people that would be reading what I wrote were just not very aware that, you know, the, the trade-off for us all having this increased uh, right to free movement within Europe um, internal borders coming down, you know, a key part of the project of European unity, which obviously UK citizens may well be about to lose, um, had this trade-off, which was that the coming down of borders internally uh, was leading to the hardening of borders around the edges of the European Union. And that particularly, uh, you know, states have the right to refuse entry to most people if, who don't have permission to enter the country, but the, the one exception is with people who are coming in to claim asylum. Uh, and that's because of some very important international agreements on the rights of refugees that have been translated into law into all European countries and hundreds of countries around the world. Uh, and so what was happening instead was that obviously, you know, individual states and the EU as a whole, there was a logic of trying to keep as many of those people from even reaching the EU as possible. And that what had grown up to, to try and achieve that was this very complex and quite violent system of deterrence, but also trying to filter people out. So making the conditions as harsh as possible so that technically you could claim asylum, but you'd have to get there by boat first, then they'd put you in a detention centre, then they'd turn your claim down, and so on and so on. Um, and you see that in various ways across Europe. But initially, I felt like going to the edges of the continent was, was the thing to do. Um, but then, as I also said, when I started to meet people, a couple of things happened. One was that I realised, of course, they didn't stay put. So I would meet somebody, I think, for example, there's a Syrian family in the book that I met in Bulgaria at the end of 2013, um, the Ahmed family, who were part of the first large group of Syrian refugees to enter the European Union. And at the time, it was a great shock. There were 10,000 people. Imagine that, 10,000 people coming to Europe to claim asylum. Obviously, two years later, it was, you know, over a million. Mm. Um, but I met them in southern Bulgaria, a few, you know, a month after they had crossed over from Turkey. But within a couple of months, they were in Sofia, the Bulgarian capital. A couple of months later, they were travelling across the northern Balkans. And then by the end of... By, by the following summer, they were in Germany. And then they carried on moving within Germany. And that was happening with... You know, I met dozens of people, and it was, for the most part, happening with, with all of them. Um, and so I wanted to just... I, it made me realise, first of all, well, this doesn't stop at the physical edges of the European Union. But then the other crucial thing is I came to realise that neither did the borders. So, you know, our traditional image of a border is either a line on a map or a fence at the edge of a, a, a territory gen denoting the limit of one nation-state's power and probably the beginning of the next. Um, but actually, the way that border control works in the 21st century, particularly in the rich parts of the world because of people and goods and capital being more mobile than it has been in the past, because of globalisation, that border systems stretch across the territory of a country or a multi-state mm -hmm. body like the EU, 
And what they're constantly trying to do is filter people. You know, and that, that stretches right into the heart of our capital cities as much as it is there at the physical border. And I really came to feel that you couldn't understand that unless you saw that from the perspective of the people trying to negotiate the harshest bit of that system. So Zainab is one of the women who tells you her story. She's from Iraq and travelled with her three children to Europe. And she spent uh, several months in Calais before reaching the UK. And I was particularly struck when I was reading uh, about her story that you described how you gave her a dictaphone to record her story. Can you tell us more about how that came about? Yeah, so there are obviously a lot of journalistic books or bit, other bits of journalism will, will, will put an emphasis on the stories of individuals. Um, one thing that I think I did slightly differently in this book was that I didn't reduce it down to one person or, or you know, a family or even a kind of easily manageable small group, you know, two or three people. There, there are nine people in this book whose stories I tell at length, and you also, through them, meet quite a lot of other people. And the reason that I wanted to do it that way is because I wanted to resist the urge to sort of elevate one particular story into something symbolic, which I feel is particular with stories around refugees happens a lot, and I dislike it for various reasons. Um, but also... What was really interesting to me was the kind of ways in which when you put lots of different experiences together, you would see the same things coming up again and again, but it would be different for each person according to all sorts of other factors that come into play. So um, what country people might be coming from, uh, the languages they have at their disposal, the amount of money they have at their disposal, uh, their gender, their age, whether they're travelling with family members, all of these things can radically alter the experience that somebody might be having on what, on the face of it, would look like quite a similar journey. And so, I know this is something we talked about earlier, but I think an issue that the media has had with covering this is that the stories have often been quite male-dominated because there are more men than women travelling along these routes, first of all. Uh, women are often at a kind of double they're doubly in danger often because there's also a greater risk of sexual assault and other kinds of assault on, on the route, so they tend to be hidden away more or hide themselves away. Um, and in the first section of the book, which is about Calais, I tried to juxtapose two people's stories. So there's the story of Jamal, who you heard about already, and in a way that that bit structured, the chapters alternate between Jamal and Zainab precisely to show the ways in which at different points in their journeys one has clear, you know, their advantages and disadvantages are changing all the time. So Jamal was a working class Sudanese young man who left Sudan with no money, um, basically survived on the streets in Greece and France for five years, living on his wits. Um, Zainab was a middle class Iraqi woman who fled after ISIS invaded northern Iraq, had a lot of money at her disposal, was able to pay for relatively safe passage using people smuggler routes all the way to Calais. But then when she got there, lost her network of contacts and was suddenly extremely vulnerable, and she had three young children with her. So there were all of these kind of changes going on. And because of the particular difficulties that someone in her situation was, she's not somebody that I could have met by going to Calais when she was in that very vulnerable situation and just saying, right, tell me your story. It, it, would have been, it would have been inappropriate for me to do that as a journalist, but it would have also not led to very good material either because she wouldn't have been in a position where she was secure enough to tell me about what was happening to her. So Zainab is somebody that I found through friends who had been in Calais after she'd arrived in the UK, and after she, you know, she had somewhere to live, she was relatively stable at that point. I was introduced her through friends that she really trusted, and I went round to meet her. I remember it was sort of November 2015, I think. It was the middle of winter. She'd, she was living in London. Uh, she'd been there only, only a few weeks. I really didn't know anybody. And we met, and her English wasn't very good at that point. And she also wasn't very sure about me. And I think also the fact that gender came into it as well, I think... In some ways, she might have been more confident in speaking to me as a man, but in other ways was quite wary of me. So what I decided in that situation, rather than trying to pressure her to give me lots of useful, juicy details 
for an offset, I, I came up with an idea pretty much on the spur of the moment, which was that, well, given that your English isn't very strong at the moment, why don't I leave you my dictaphone and you just tell your story into it in Arabic in whatever way you want and just, you know, I, I remember saying to her, just tell me about the bits that are important to you. The other reason why I did that, I think, is because that was at a, quite a late stage in my research, so this was already when I'd, I'd you know, been doing two or three years of this, and I'd, I'd got a bit tired of asking the same questions and started to think, well, I'm sort of, I, I, in my mind, I've got the kind of details I want to try and mm. find, but maybe I'm missing other things. Like, well, why don't I let somebody, you know, rather than me coming with any preconceived ideas, just see what comes up. And so we did it that way around. I then got an Arabic-speaking um, friend to translate and transcribe the interview. We then went back round to visit Zainab, and I had a list of questions for clarity. And then we did a second interview based on that, but I had somebody acting as inter <coughs> interpreter. Brilliant. It's just a really interesting way to kind of approach exactly what you've just said, that idea of the, almost the fatigue of those questions and going around and hearing the same things, because if you frame the questions in a certain way, you also elicit certain answers, right? So, it, it, And particularly seeing, hearing a woman's voice at that, at that point as somebody from a middle-class family who'd made it to England gives another, another perspective, which we don't so often hear. Um, I'd like to come back to this question about the, the borders that you talk about a lot and you've alluded to already, but in the introduction, you describe your book as investigating the effects of Europe's border crisis. Um, on the people caught up in it, and you talk of the militarisation, military, I'll say it right in a minute, of the external borders of Europe, so that this idea of taking a train or crossing a land border is no longer possible within Europe unless you have the right passport, the right papers, enough money, all of those things that you talked about earlier that are sort of sifting people. Um, so, um, and it's interesting to be talking about it as the border crisis rather than the, the, the refugee crisis and raising the question of who's in and who's out, which was also and who belongs and who doesn't, which was also felt very acutely by the people that you met and talked to, I think. So can you tell us a bit more about, about that and, as, as you said, what has effectively become this system for filtering? Yeah, so that phrase border crisis was something that I started to use in 2015 when I not making any claims to originality. It's something that academics who, who work on this have, you know, used prior to that, and that's where I picked it up from. But, you know, it was at the peak of the refugee crisis. I was being asked to write pieces explaining what was going on, and I wrote something for the London Review of Books that was the first time I tried to set that out in detail. And the reason I thought that term was quite useful was that, in, in fact, particularly in 2015, I said, actually, what's happening is there's, there's two things going on at once. There is the Syrian refugee crisis. So there was you know, this very acute, large-scale displacement of people from Syria because of the war there. Um, also, a wider, ongoing displacement of people from other conflicts and other bits of instability, often in the Middle East, but also from further afield. And that the impact of that was actually really being felt mainly outside of Europe. So to take Syria as the example, the vast majority of Syrian refugees have never even tried to reach Europe. They've been hosted in Syria's neighbouring countries, Turkey, Lebanon and Jordan. It's only, a, it's only a minority of people that ever tried to make that journey to the European Union. But the, there was a second thing going on, which was that well, what happens when they come into contact with that border system that I, I briefly described already? And I think a key feature of that, which you know, goes back to the 1990s at least, as, as European unity developed internally and those borders started to come down, which is that the policies that are supposed to be there to control migration and to make these uncomfortable problems we'd rather not think about go away actually cause or exacerbate the problems they're supposedly there to solve. So that sounds a bit convoluted, I know, but to give an example, you know, if you think over the last however many years you've heard EU politicians talk about the need to combat people trafficking and combat people smuggling and that that's framed as a humanitarian act. You know, we, we, we have these border controls in order to protect people from the evil traffickers who will abuse and exploit them. Now, some of those smugglers and traffickers do abuse and exploit the people whose journeys they're also facilitating, but 
it misses an important point, which is why, why are people turning to that form of travel in the first place? And that is very often to do with a, you know, a rule or a form of border control that has already been put in place. So if you wondered at any point during the Syrian refugee crisis why you didn't see large numbers of Syrians boarding aeroplanes or trains or coaches or any of the other forms of public transport that we could use to go between the Middle East and Europe, it's because there's an EU directive that penalises transport carriers who allow people with, to come into the EU without correct visas. And there, there are hefty fines for airline companies and the rest of it. Um, you know, there are the, the militarization aspect is that over the last two decades, the EU has been putting lots of money into physical defenses around the edges of the European Union. Fences, surveillance patrols, um, you know, uh, more police, all of that. And so really what happened was that you had this, this process of that all progressively getting tougher, easier and safer routes via which people could seek asylum being closed off. It's pretty much impossible to do what I think is the, the sort of traditional image of claiming asylum, which is walking into an embassy and saying, I want to defect. You know, you can't, if, if you live in, I mean, when it's politically convenient for that to happen, it does. But if you live in Africa or the Middle East or South Asia, you can't walk into a European embassy and do that. The only way you can really claim asylum in a European country is to physically get there yourself. And so all of that was being closed down. And then when, you know, you had a large scale crisis around the edges of the European Union, a lot of it linked to the turmoil that resulted from the Arab uprisings and then the, the counter revolutions that, that ensued. Lots of people, although by no means the majority, trying to leave those situations came into contact with that system. And I think that's the heart of the crisis. And I think if you don't see that, then it's very easy for it to be interpreted as all about those people over there who we don't really have anything to do with, don't know why they're doing what they're doing, coming over here and causing us problems. So that's mm. what, that, that perception is something that I've tried very strongly to counter. Mm. And it's something that I remember seeing and thinking about a lot when I was in northern Greece and been in Thessaloniki and driving north to the border with the former Republic, Republic of, uh, Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia, where that border, everybody was, there were you know, thousands of people literally walking along the railway tracks, following the railway tracks. They couldn't get on the trains, but they thought, we'd, we'll walk to the border, and then that border closed. So, and all these people were just coming up behind and coming up behind, and suddenly there was this huge yeah. camp at and, suddenly there and was everybody a... went, well, how did this get here? And it was not an accident that it was there. And it's... I mean, I don't know exactly when you were there, but I was there the week they started closing those borders. Mm. And literally within 24 hours, there was a refugee camp where there hadn't been one the night before. Exactly. And then they had to close the, the trains and then all of those abandoned yeah. stations. And, and similarly at the stations in, in Serbia and in Hungary, people were hanging around at the stations again because you know, there's paradox of these being places where you would normally travel and be moving or on a journey. Yeah. You could get no further. Yeah, and that actually makes me think of something I, d I didn't write about in the book, but I, I did write about for, in an article for the Lon London Review of Books in uh, the end of 2015, which was kind of at that moment that the, you know, the, board, the borders in the Balkans that had been opened up that summer were all progressively closed down after the Paris mm -hmm. um, terror attacks in November 2015. And that what really illustrated that for me, that this the role of border control in changing those whole, you know, the, the nature and shape or even the way we think about those kind of journeys was the fact that I'd been going to Athens to do reporting there since 2012. I'd got good contacts with the Afghan community in Athens who are a mix of people who have settled in Greece, but also probably a larger group who arrive in Greece and they're trying to get elsewhere in Europe. And there's, there's an area uh, of inner city Athens where that community is based and for, you know, for years, Afghans arriving have known that's where you go to find a people smuggler who will take you through the Balkans to Germany or Sweden or wherever else you might want to go. And the, up until 2015, that was people smuggling. It was illegal. It happened in secret. Um, and, you know, with all, with all the kind of connotations that surround it. And then I went back in... Oh, I can't remember when it was. At some point in 2015... Yeah, towards the end of the year, I went back, and because the borders in the Balkans had been opened, 
Greece had relaxed its own law, which there's another EU directive which makes it illegal to give transport to anyone who you think might be an undocumented migrant. So, you know, this is why retired couples on the French-Italian border are being arrested and charged with people trafficking, and it, similar things have been happening around Europe for the last few years as they've cracked down on it. But Greece relaxed that law in the summer of 2015, and suddenly the people smugglers, who were also Afghan, became travel agents, and they opened up a shop on the square in this neighbourhood, and it openly advertised cheap bus tickets to Macedonia, good price, you know. I got an Afghan friend to go and translate the show. And it, it was just openly selling what was an organised criminal activity a couple of months before. And then at the end of 2015, laws snapped back into place and they became people smugglers again. So for me, that, <coughs> that summed up mm. what we were talking about. Mm. And for a lot of refugees, when they arrive in a new place and they claim asylum, they're sent to accommodation or detention centres, which are often outside the city, not very accessible, their movement's restricted. They spend months, often years, in this kind of limbo. I think you describe it as a sort of grey zone. And they don't know how, how long they're going to be there, um, when or how their situation will change, or when their asylum claim will be processed. Um, and linked to that is that sense of kind of powerlessness and and infantilization almost, where they have no autonomy, they're banned from working, they can't contribute, even the way that they're given their money. In Italy, for example, it's talked about as being pocket money. And Caesar, I think, the guy you meet in Sicily, was in that kind of situation when you met him, wasn't yeah. he? Yeah, so this situation of being in a kind of prolonged limbo when you're seeking asylum. So when you've arrived somewhere that should be your place of safety, it should be somewhere you're settled or a new home, and actually what you're done is kept at arm's length by the state in one way or another. And you're, you're there, but you're not really there, in, uh, which I'll, I'll explain in a bit. If people here have read about direct provision in Ireland, that's, that's uh, to me, a very typical example of that. People are kind of both physically and psychologically segregated. Um, I, for, I'll try and just briefly give a bit of context to that that I think is important, which is this, this really comes down to the way... Well, it comes down to what refugee law is and what the, the problem that it's trying to solve, or the kind of gap that it's trying to plug in our system of rights, which is that, and you know, this is the, the refugee protection system has existed as we have it broadly since the end of the Second World War. Um, and the people that designed that were trying to solve this issue, which is that we might think of human rights as universal, but actually they're only, in, in most meaningful senses, guaranteed by your membership of a nation state. So the fact that you're a citizen of somewhere. If you're not a citizen of a place, you can't access most of those rights. You're, you're, you're not protected. And a lot of the time that's fine. Most of us are citizens of places we're either born in or we immigrate to, and there, there are systems in place for helping us access that. Um, but if you are forcibly displaced, if you lose your home and you have to flee your country or you're exiled or anything like that, you, you lose your citizenship, either you're, you're formally stripped of it or you lose it de facto because you can't go back to your home country. And so the failure to reconcile that issue in the first half of the 20th century led to huge problems. It led to sort of mass statelessness among displaced Jews, Armenians, uh, Spanish people fleeing the Civil War in the 1930s and the rest of it. And as someone like the philosopher Hannah Arendt has argued, directly fed into the rise of authoritarianism in that interwar period. And you had these, these to use a modern term, populist figures, far-right figures, spring up saying, we're going to clean up this city or we're going to clean up this country of all of these illegal aliens who are here. And so after the Second World War, there was an attempt to put this fix in place, which was to create an international system that said, well, if you are made stateless and you flee because of war or persecution, there's an international agreement in place whereby you can apply for asylum in another country and be on a route to access those rights. But there are two big problems with that. One is that that immediately implies there's a definition of who is entitled to apply for asylum and receive it, which in turn implies, well, who? what about the people that don't meet that definition? If there are people who are inside, there have got to be people on the outside. So you have to have systems in place 
doing more of this filtering, more of this sorting that I was talking about earlier. Um, and then the second thing is where you have countries that are um, signed up to that in principle, but either are unable to really fulfill it in practice or don't really want to because they actually are trying to use it as a tool to control immigration. They might say, well, yes, in, in principle, we, we accept um, the idea of refugee protection, but we really can't handle that many Syrians coming over here for whatever political reason there is. And so systems are made partly by design, partly by incompetence to be slow, dysfunctional, unfair, harsh, uh, psychologically draining, all of these other things. And then what that results in is many of the people who come to a country in Europe seeking protection, thinking that it's going to be a quick process, fall into this limbo which can go on for years and years. And so that takes us back up to this um, man I met in Sicily called Caesar, who was originally from Mali. Um, I mean, he, you know, I met many, many people in this kind of situation, living in either reception centres or refugee camps, without much information about when their claims were going to be heard, what kind of rights they had, really just sitting there thinking, oh, I just want to know, and I want to be able to get on with my life in order to do one or other thing. Some people had, you know, some people had very, very ambitious uh, hopes. I met people who said, I'm, I want to be a women's rights activist and raise the alarm about what is happen happening to Nigerian women being trafficked across the sea from Libya to Europe. Um, or people with dreams about you know, going to university, building careers for themselves. Caesar really struck me because he was always extremely sort of the opposite of that. He, he, he just said, I, don't, I just don't care where I live. I just want to get an everyday boring job just, and forget about what's happened to me because he'd had a, you know, some very bad experiences both during the civil war in Mali in 2012, and then he was trafficked and abused multiple times on his journey through Algeria and Libya. Um, but the system that was supposed to be protecting him, and it was protecting him in a way, he, was, he had a roof over his head, he was given three meals a day, uh, he was given some Italian language lessons, and he was given what unfortunately was referred to as pocket money, the support money that you're given as asylum seekers, but he wasn't allowed to live independently. And that really, really got to him. He felt like he was being held back. Um, this is, you know, that living in that kind of limbo, I've heard from psychologists who work with refugees, can really, really exacerbate people's trauma. Um, often it, it can bring up trauma that they didn't think they had because they're unable to move on with their lives. And also people find it incredibly patronising and infantilising. And I, Caesar, I wanted to tell his story in this book particularly because he, he just was so clear about that. You know, it was things like, you know, he's someone, when, when I was getting to know him, he was around 30 years old, knew a lot about politics, both, both at home and in Europe and the rest of it, always wanted to talk about that. Um, but he was having anti-racist groups come to his refugee accommodation and getting him to make posters for demonstrations and colour them in with felt-tip pens, you know, mm. or decorate his locker, you know. And that's things that I saw all over at Italian reception centres. Um, and what struck me was that those were well-meaning things. These were people who wanted to help and wanted to campaign, but really they, they too were... There wasn't a lot... They, their hands were tied by that wider system because although those forms of support are really, really important and can make the difference between somebody going under or not, without people also having the rights that most of us would take for granted to work, to move around, to make decisions for ourselves, there's a limit to that. Sure. Um, before we open it up for questions, I just want to come back to, in fact, to, to where you started with that excerpt that you read about the, the Ukraine. <coughs> you, you said that you... You went there because there was a connection to your own family's story and particularly on your maternal grandmother's side. And you, you talk in the book about the impact that, that hearing those stories as a child when your grandmother was telling you how that it made an impact. And I, and I just wondered, as you were researching this book, writing this book, how much those memories of your family's stories were kind of resonating as you, as you wrote. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, like I, like I said, it was one of, the, one of the things that made me want to deal with this subject as a journalist. Um, and because, because I grew up either living with or very close to my grandmother, and she did a lot of looking after me and my brother when we were kids, I would, she, and it, one of the ways she would basically keep us entertained was just to tell us stories that were these kind of neat little episodes. So do you want to hear about the time when I was eight years old 
and we had to cross cross the Russian border and were almost you know caught and shot or how did I get from Berlin to Britain and three days before war was declared and the borders were closed in 1939 and the rest of it. So I think what that did was give me, I just always, it gave me, a, it meant that whenever I sort of saw similar stories around, they would immediately sort of res, resonate. You know, they would strike a chord, oh, that's familiar to me, I know this. Um, and also, I think it, just the process of telling the stories and having it passed down like that rather than reading it in a book or seeing it in a film, I think is why I ended up d doing what was a very kind of talking-based book um, in that it's really a lot of... You know, the, 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 the substance of it is my conversations with people rather than... You know, another thing that these kind of book, journalistic books do very commonly is turn everything into that third-person, om omniscient narration where... That I think gives the reader the illusion that they have access to everything. You know, they can go anywhere, they can know anything. And this is largely narrated in the first person, because actually, just as I had to question my relationship to the people in the book, I kind of want the reader to do that as well. I want I want it to be clear that actually, no, you don't have unlimited access to these people's experiences, and that actually they're negotiating with me over what they're prepared to say, what they want from me in return, and the rest of it. And and where. The, the stories from my family come into it is that I think that what helped me create that form of telling the story was the fact that I was constantly sort of com comparing what was similar and what was different in those stories. So I think particularly earlier on in, in the course of the project, in the first year or so I was doing it, I went in a bit naively to situations thinking, you know, oh, I'll tell them that you know, my family were refugees too, and it turned out all right for us, and one day it will for you, and very quickly came to realise that wasn't a good thing to mm -hmm. even be thinking when you're talking to people about this. Um, and it made me realise how much more of a constant this stuff was, how the sort of, you know, displacement, moving, trying to find a new home, trying to find ways to make sense of what's happened to you, it's just ongoing. And actually... If it doesn't seem like to like that to us all the time, it's because of, I suppose, because of, because of power and how that determines which stories are heard and which aren't, and which ones are given a kind of mythical quality. So, my grandmother was was Jewish, and so <coughs> Jewish refugees in Europe in the 20th century immediately kind of, you know, it's got all these associations. It's got for for people living in Europe, I think it's got extremely strong kind of moral. You know, there's this huge moral context to it. Like, we know that this, this terrible thing happened and we have to make sure it never happens again. Um, and, in fact, that was the spirit in which something like the post-war refugee law system was set up. But, obviously, it does happen again and again. And so exploring, well, what does that mean if it is more of a constant and why people are heard and why they aren't and what, what is useful about bringing those stories to light <coughs> were questions that were constantly in my mind when I was, when I was doing the work on this. Mm. Brilliant. Well, we could carry on talking for a long time, but I'd like to open it up to the floor to see if there are any questions that you would like to ask Daniel. I think there's, there are mics at the back, yes? So don't be shy. Yes, lady at the front here. Thank you very much, Daniel, for a very stimulating talk and a, a book that uh, opened up my thinking a, a lot more by the fact that these were real stories, real people. I, I, I'll try to keep my question short. Um, if there was one thing that you would say to the ordinary Irish citizen that we could do, what would that be? I mean... I'm always told with that kind of question to tell people they should be actively doing something, and I feel like a bit of a hypocrite for doing that because what I do is write about things rather than there are many, many more useful ways of intervening, I think. But really, it's pay attention to what's happening and decide what to do on the basis of that, I think. Um, and if you already are, then looking at ways in which people are trying to intervene either locally within Ireland or things that Ireland as a country that's got its own resources can be doing to intervene in this situation. So I think later you're going to hear from people who've been involved in search and rescue on behalf of the Irish Navy. But, you know, there's things at that scale. There's, you know, choices you can make about who you vote for and what policies are taken. But I think also 
what, what is just as important to me because of what I was just describing with Caesar and the fact that people are thrown into limbo so often is often you can't change those bigger things anytime soon. So finding ways you can actually meaningfully, meaningfully intervene in the lives of people who are close by to you who might be in these situations is really important. And I know there are organisations in Ireland that already do really good work on this, so finding out more about them would be good. Right. Anyone else? Yes. I had an observation. I've, I've worked in. Um, I like to. I like to term border crisis. I've been involved in that myself for about five years, but um, I went travelling um, for about six months, and I discovered some of the places where refugees have now, particularly Syrians and Yemenis, because they're the most limited in where they can go, particularly because of this rule about you can't just simply get on a plane, as as Daniel was explaining. Um, but so they have found other places to go to. And there's like some countries like Ecuador or Ethiopia, uh, Haiti, uh, Malaysia. There's all these people that they, like, you know, they, they research and find, I can, oh, right, I'll try there. I'll go there. And they can get on a plane and go to these places. Uh, so I was recently in Korea in an island called Jeju. And there's 450 Yemenis living in there because the word got out. And now there's loads of Yemenis on this little island, you know. And they've built their own community. And they've opened up restaurants and everything. And there's... The people on the island are, are coming round to it, you know. And then I was in Ethiopia and I was actually visiting a guy that I was working with who I was trying to help to get him safe somewhere. And the only place we could... He was, he was stuck in the Emirates and they were threatening to deport him back to Syria. And the only safe place that we could get him on a plane to was Ethiopia. So he ended up in Addis Ababa. So I went to visit him there. And there's, now, there's a community of 150 Syrians living in Addis Ababa. And they've built their own community. And they've now got a restaurant. They've got a bakery and things like that. And they've got a hub. And then if, if, I didn't go to Sudan, but I was hearing the stories of an, in northern Sudan. There's a whole Syrian community there. And there's another Syrian community in Ecuador. And it's just, I just think it's quite interesting that they've, they, they've found, that, you know, not all, you know, like just some people have gone, okay, let's forget this Europe dream. Let's forget doing this. There's other places. Let's go and try it. And I, I, I just, I'd say from a journalistic point of view, it would be a very interesting exercise to explore these little communities that, that are yeah. building up all over the world. Absolutely, yeah. and I think that also points to something that, that's going on with, with the stories in Europe as well, which is another thing that I've tried to show in the book, which is just how contingent all of the decision-making is. That Again, that's, that's certainly the impression often given by the British media, that you know, it's, it's these people coming to us because they specifically want to come to us because we've, either we've got something that they want, like benefits or housing or whatever, or even a more... It's kind of self-aggrandizing self-image of Europe. Like, of course, people want to come to Europe. It must be their dream that they've nurtured since they were a little boy. And so, you know, it's often not. It's really based on where can I go at this particular moment, which, again, is a constant story of migration and particularly of displacement. Um, I think my grandmother, for example, one of the factors in making her decide to come to the UK when she needed to get out of Germany was that she had somebody who could obtain a work permit. Um, I think she worked as a designer for... Was, what's the, the big fancy department store in Dublin? Brown something? Yeah, she, she designed underwear for them for a few months for a factory in Belfast, you know. But it was, that was one of the things that meant she came to Britain and didn't try to go to America or didn't try and go somewhere else. It's just people are seeking stability, full stop. It's not necessarily... Yeah, abso absolutely. Yeah. There's another question down here. I was struck from what you said and from what I read in the mainstream papers every day about some people, quote, get out, escape, but the majority are trapped. And one thing that does strike me right across Europe is the rise of far right wing parties. But much worse than that is the mainstream centre parties moving right in hunting for votes in general elections. And that's not universal, but it does happen from Spain right across Europe. To, to Poland, and there is hardly an exception I can think of in elections in the last few years where centre parties themselves have not adopted the way of thinking and often the way of speaking about uh, migrants, refugees, which we'd have thought a year previously belonged only to the far right. 
So looking at the byline there, hope or despair, um, where's the hope? <laughs> um, yeah, I think you're absolutely right in identifying the, at least a big part of the problem is, is it's about parties of the centre moving rightwards. Or, I mean, even some parties of the centre-left taking on anti-immigration positions, like, like the Danish centre-left, who, who recently managed to win, um, come out top in the elections there a few months ago, partly with an with, with anti-immigration line. Um, and that the things I saw in my book were all the result of policies by cent parties of the centre. There are no far-right parties in government, certainly when I was writing this book, and there aren't really now. You know, there's, there's a far-right party in the Italian coalition government where, you know, Salvini is the interior minister and is able to be pushing things mm. more in his direction, but it's, it's still within the power of those parties of the centre which represent the majority of citizens in Europe to make things worse or make things better. So I would say where the grounds for hope are is that that can be changed in the other direction, but I think it needs people to pressure them and it needs <coughs> politicians with the confidence to show that they can both um, put forward visions of society that make citizens resident here feel confident about the future without pandering to that kind of anti-immigration logic. So I think... Th th this, this can be done, and you do see signs of hope, where, like, in, in Denmark, for example, the immediate kind of knee-jerk interpretation of that election was that, oh, well, the Danish centre-left won, got back into government because they cracked down on immigration. Actually, they didn't really improve their vote that much. What happened was that they were boosted by a party slightly to the left of them, and together were able to form a coalition, and that that party... In fact, both the, the further left party and the Danish party, what they'd done most strongly, consistently across both platforms, was say, we want to protect the Danish welfare state and we want to support poorer people in Danish society. And I think that often gets overlooked and it, it, it seems as if it, you know, opposing immigration is this one trick that you need to do to get back into government. And I think trying to demolish that idea is, way, is the way forwards, basically. I, just as a caveat, I would say that because of how politics is changing, the, the, the behaviour of far-right politicians and parties is also a kind of danger in itself. And the crucial difference, which I think sometimes gets mixed, missed, is um, to take Italy, for example, the previous government, which was run by the centre-left, was the one that, first of all, started cracking down on rescues in the Mediterranean. Obviously, the government that's got Salvini as interior minister has intensified it, or to look at the US, the Obama administration was the one that ramped up deportation to people back to uh, Latin America. Trump has taken it a step further. Um, but we should, I, th I think the only way you're going to be able to properly deal with that situation is, is to resist saying, oh, well, they're all the same, there's no difference between any of those people. Because what you've got is the difference between what I would say is the mistaken response to a situation that people have got a genuine interest in making better. You know, like the, the previous Italian government, I think, wanted to keep to its humanitarian obligations but felt it had to crack down because it was worried about where its voters would go. Whereas the likes of Salvini and Trump and the rest of it, they're deliberately making the situation worse in order to create chaos and gather more people to support them in order to get more power for themselves, basically. So being able to kind of maintain that clarity, I think, is really important as well. OK, well, I think we're out of time. So it just remains for me to thank Daniel Trilling for sharing these powerful and extraordinary stories. Um, there are copies of the book to buy at the back, I think, and you'll probably be signing as well. So please join me in thanking Daniel. Thank you. <laughs>
And when you look at Jamal, five years, as you said, living on the streets, he sets up systems of organization in Calais, just as your photographs demonstrated, Sarah, last year when we saw them. There was a picture of an entire street in the middle of the jungle with restaurants, with a library, with a church, with a cinema, with all kinds of things going on that people had made for themselves. When you see that, when you read what Jamal got up to, I mean, the, the, whole, the whole business of finding food, for example, he has a whole bunch of people going to uh, the big supermarkets to see what they're throwing out. He's endless ways of foraging for supplies, people to cook the food, do all that kind of thing. These are people we need in our lazy Western countries who wouldn't have a clue how to organise stuff like that. So, you know, we should be far more welcome than we are. And I must say... Ireland's reputation in this respect is shameful. Uh, tomorrow morning, if you're up to it, 10 o'clock, you will be hearing from the, the direct voices, as Daniel has so beautifully done, of three people who live in direct provision here in Ireland, some of them for far longer than they should. So if you're interested in that, do come along again tomorrow morning. Thanks again to Daniel and Sarah, and thanks to you.